This episode of Musical Hell is brought to you by Midnight Musicals. Welcome to the podcast Musical Underground. Thank you. Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and what is that? Is there a sulfur leak in here? Over here! Donna? What the here is this? No celestial strains of Mozart, no salutations and blessings upon thee? Well, I know how very busy you are these days. I didn't want to rudely intrude on your schedule. You're here off the record, aren't you? My visit might be somewhat less than officially sanctioned, yes. <sighs> All right, I could use a bit of novelty. What's the story, Holy Glory? It seems there's a production that certain members of my faction are eager to see come before your tribunal, and, uh, well, here. Sweet Lucifer, is that Saturday's warrior? Are you trying to get me on the Latter-day Saints shit list? You know those Curtin McConkey lawyers make ours look principled, right? I know, but it's not a very good musical, and honestly, someone needs to say it. So why don't you tell them? Mormons have that thing where literally any of them can receive divine revelation. Just show up to some random Salt Lake City tour guide and- They don't actually listen to us. It took decades to get anywhere with them on the matter of race, and we haven't even gotten to square one where women are concerned. Besides, it might actually soften the blow coming from your end. If they don't like it, they can just dismiss it as your normal evil routine. Ugh, <sighs> figures that I end up doing your dirty work. Fine, but you're joining me. What? No! I I'm just the messenger! So, help me message some context into this LDS trip. You can always claim I forced you into it afterwards. Oh, all right, but don't expect me to be happy about it. What can I say? Misery loves company. So, let's examine the case of Saturday's Warrior. A brief rundown for those of you who are not Mormon and therefore probably never heard of this particular gem, it was initially conceived in the 1970s by Douglas Stewart and Lex de Azevedo, but gained something of a cult following, for various values of the term, thanks to a home video pro shot from 1989. In 2016, Stewart and Azevedo, prompted by the latter's daughters, revamped the script and score for a filmed adaptation, which is what comes before the court today. In any case, both versions start off in a kind of ethereal train station where souls hang out before they're born. Life on Earth is just a blink of an eye Moving so fast yet so slow Well, good thing God changed his mind about black people in 1978, otherwise they wouldn't have anyone to do this soulful riffing. You'd better not steal all my punchlines, or I'm going to regret doing this. Actually, I kind of regret it already, because the production values are absurdly terrible. The lip sync on the song tracks is very bad, the 1972 setting is conveyed mostly by goodwill purchases and a couple of vintage cars, and the attempts to disguise the fact that this whole thing was shot in a few square miles of Utah are embarrassing. San Francisco is established with a stock footage shot that I'm convinced was in Tommy Wiseau's files, and what we're told is an airport terminal is clearly a hotel conference center with some gate signs pasted up. Also, why is it that mortal depictions of my home plane are so invariably dull? Is their best idea of the glories of the celestial realm really just a slightly foggy train station? The opening number is interrupted by the arrival of one Todd Richards and his girlfriend, or rather the woman destined to be his girlfriend on Earth, Julie. Todd is due to be born, and they're trying to arrange winding up in close proximity to one another. How about the same family? Yes. That'd be great, yeah. No! Oh, no! No, oh, no, no! No, it's fine. You'll go down first to one of those fundamentalist sects. She'll be the daughter of your second or third wife, and you can take it from there. Sweet Lucifer, even I thought that was dark. I've read Under the Banner of Heaven. It tends to stay with you. Uh, fair point. Soulful token black guy tells Todd and Julie he can't accommodate requests, so Julie has to content herself with making Todd swear not to look at or even think of another woman until she comes into his life. I love you. And if I have to search the whole world, I'll find you. What if I'm ugly? Buckle up, my children. This is only a foretaste of the female representation this movie has to offer. 
After more questionable lip-syncing to a less-than-inspiring love ballad, Julie and Todd part, and Julie takes solace in her family of future siblings. But alas, her comfort is short-lived as the two eldest, Jimmy and Pam, are also scheduled for departure. <laughs> Besides, if we wait too long, we'll have to wind up dealing with a shit ton of jabs about the office. The youngest of the brood, a sweet little tyke called Emily, is worried that her prospective parents will be all babied out by the time her turn comes to be born. But Jimmy promises he will ensure her arrival, and all of them sing a piece that makes the Osmonds look like Gladys Knight and the Pips. I would stay by you, Jimmy. The other side was that. Oh, never mind. That was just the Mack truck-sized foreshadowing blowing through. Next up on the birthing schedule is a pair of future missionaries. One an eager true believer ready to convert the world, and the other his shy, somewhat dorky sidekick. Oh, sweet Lucifer, it's Elder Price and Elder Cunningham from Book of Mormon. Oh, come now. They're not that similar. Ahem. <clears throat> We're destined to be the greatest team of missionaries the world has ever known. Me and... But mostly me! I concede the point. The characters' actual names are Wally Kessler and Harold Green, and they have a little number about how effective they're going to be at the most generally despised form of religious expression. We are not the ordinary, fearlessly extraordinary, working righteous Harry Carey. What does that even mean? And furthermore, why do we spend 20 whole minutes in this boring pre-existence segment? Great Comet didn't take that long establishing backstory, and it had to summarize war and peace. None of these characters, or their soon-to-be-dashed hopes for their earthly lives, are interesting enough to justify the time devoted to them, especially with the dull inspirational pop that makes up the score. I'm sailing over. I'm sailing on. I'm sorry, ma'am. This one doesn't seem to want to come out just yet. It's almost like he's stuck doing a self-indulgent ballad in there. We finally leave Bland Central Station and arrive in the town of Riverdale, Colorado, which is not an actual town, although there is a Riverdale Road, which is the purported site of various paranormal and demonic activity. I can neither confirm nor deny those rumors. In any case, the worst thing going on here is an aspiring Partridge family performing in a talent show, which may be bad enough. Move over, Jackson 5, here come the Flinders 9! Did he just admit to being a relentlessly abusive patriarch pushing his children into an entertainment career to pursue his own ends? Either way, the shoehorned 70s references are yet another way the movie tries and fails to establish its setting. Jimmy is now a broody young man who the local girls squeal over like he's the second coming of Elvis and Paul McCartney put together, and Pam is now confined to a wheelchair, which is so tragic because her pre-existent soul was all about the dancing. But as you may have figured out, Pam's one character trait is that she's too good for this sinful earth, and being disabled is just one more way to establish that. And in spite of her pre-birth vows to Todd, Julie now has something of an understanding with none other than soon-to-be-departing missionary Wally. Uh, my mom made me promise not to make you any more promises. Okay, does your mom not care about your integrity? Hmm? Because I remember this. And whose signature is that? Huh? Mine. Julie has all the spinal integrity of a slug in the River Phlegathon, I swear. Now, now, at least part of the problem is Wally being the most insufferable would-be suitor outside of a Jane Austen novel. Eh, true. In fact, Wally is sin number three. I know he's the writer's exercising a little Mormon self-referential humor, but he's a little too good at being a smug dick who twists scripture to his own purposes. But to get back to the original point, Julie is a prime example of sin number four, which is that the women in this movie are either flakes, doormats, or temptresses, and they generally have no identity or purpose beyond being either supporting players in men's lives or baby factories. Sometimes both. 
Jimmy, meanwhile, has trials of his own in the desire to pursue a musical career away from the family band. He's encouraged in this by his friends who embody the temptations which Jimmy must resist, namely individualism and deviation from the status quo. For real this time, and keep that melody. Every day the world is getting smaller by far. Bursting at the seams, what can we do? And also the evils of sustainable population growth? Like a lot of faith-based stories, this one is really terrible at representing the views it opposes, to the point where those views make more sense than anything it's trying to sell. Who can be strong? Who can be strong? suppose the writers kept the setting in the 1970s because they thought it showed this concern was unreasonable? See, it's 50 years later and nobody's starving to death, except for some dark-skinned people in countries we can't find on a map which have been ravaged by colonialism and climate change, but everything's peachy in Salt Lake City and that's really what matters. Jimmy's token black friend, his name is Mac or something, is convinced Jimmy's anthem to family planning and reproductive health is the breakout single they've been looking for, but Jimmy is concerned it might be a bit too preachy. And if that isn't the Mormon calling the Jehovah's Witness black. Anyway, Jimmy returns to his overcrowded, handicap inaccessible home in time for dinner, where the conversation mostly exists to demonstrate how Mom is a good Mormon mother whose life entirely revolves around her large brood of ankle biters. Angie, uh, go apologize. I made a statement of fact. Benjamin, go now. Looks like the younger boys have figured out they already outrank their mother by virtue of having a penis. I can see why Jimmy wants out of this. His siblings are interchangeable, snotty brats, with the exception of Pam, who's saintly and doomed, and Julie, who's an emotional basket case. His mom is a cipher, and his dad reminds me of nothing so much as the Wallace Shawn character in The Incredibles, a mediocre, petty tyrant driven by a mistaken belief in his own innate superiority. You know, Jimmy, I wish, I wish so badly that you would just stop spouting this hippie crap and think for yourself. Which is why I'm sending you to the stake president so he can ensure you're thinking for yourself in the way I want you to think for yourself. Mom and Dad sing a sad song about how Jimmy is no longer a six-year-old who implicitly believes everything they tell him, and Jimmy comes back to have some bonding time with his soon-to-be-dead sister. I just believe there's more to life than just this life. There's a plan. Okay, we have reached a central sin in this material, but it's going to need a little setup as it touches on the concept of theodicy. And since that is more the opposition's wheelhouse, I defer to my erstwhile colleague Donna to explain. Thank you! Theodicy is a philosophical exercise which seeks to reconcile the idea of a benevolent creator with the empirical evidence that the universe is often, well... Kinda shitty? If one were to be extremely crude about it, yes. There is nothing inherently wrong in seeking meaning and solace in the face of an often cruel and chaotic world, but Saturday's Warrior goes about it in the worst possible way. In being presented with the eternal question of why do bad things happen, the only reasoning it provides is A, it's all part of the divine plan, and therefore B, the only thing to be done is just to meekly accept it. Pam, of course, is the poster child for this particular message, but her mom gets a huge assist when she admits being treated as a human clown car is not all it's cracked up to be. Mom, are you okay? Honey, I love your dad. I do. I don't want you to think that I... It's just life. <laughs> Given that Utah has some of the higher rates of depression, suicide, and opioid deaths in the United States, it's especially aggravating that this movie comes so very close to actually addressing some of the root factors of that, and then just shrugs and says, oh well, life happens when you're making other plans, just accept it and shove all those sad feelings deep down where nobody will ever find them. 
It offers neither comfort nor solutions, only unquestioning resignation. Perhaps it's unsurprising that a religion whose very name implies an imminent eschatological reckoning for humankind offers no real investment in addressing or alleviating the ills which plague them, but it's still awful to witness. Perhaps one might learn something about the follies of presuming an unalterable destiny from this movie? What are you implying? Oh, nothing. Shall we get back to Julie and her increasingly absurd love life? Right, Julie. So with Wally gone, she's taken to walking out with Elder Rebound, and it's gotten to the point where she's gotten engaged to him and broken things off with Wally. Girl makes Ado Annie look like Penelope. Wally is distressed by Julie's inconsistency, and even more distressed by the fact that people don't like random strangers coming up to them and trying to get them to change religions. Go figure. Elder Harold, who, like Pam, exists to be a model of blind faith, tells Wally that they just need to trust in the big guy, which may be a bit of a stretch for Wally, who believes primarily in himself. I mean, just look around. There are just goldens everywhere. Like them. Huh? Them? Sure, that'll go over well. Hey, ladies, do you want to give up free love and bodily autonomy and serve as a warm uterus for insecure men like ourselves? Alas, Wally and Harold are missing a golden opportunity, as right there in the park is the incarnated Todd, who is currently making his living as an unusually bad street artist. His has been a hard life, with a drunken mother and an abusive father, and he has been desperately searching for meaning in his life. As this is a Mormon movie, other faith systems like Buddhism and Catholicism have so far been unable to provide this. Back in Stepford, USA, Jimmy's bandmates reveal they've been offered a contract with Capitol Records, who apparently are just handing out lucrative recording deals with $200,000 advances to just anybody these days. Jimmy feels the money could help with his family's strained budget, but has his doubts when said family shows up at his gig and look all sad and disappointed at his Zero Population song. And every baby makes it last a short time Oh, I do hope they never hear White Rabbit. It might just give them a conniption fit. As it is, Pam looking like Jimmy started kicking puppies in front of her is enough to shame him away from his bandmates. It doesn't last as the minute he gets home, Dad launches in with, How dare you betray everything we taught you by showing concern for the global community? And Mom reveals that she's several months pregnant, and things escalate very quickly from there. Adam! Oh! Oh, baby, what? Remember, kids, if your mom is pregnant and you yell at your parents and run away after your dad gets physically abusive, she will have a miscarriage. All that medical talk you hear about pregnancy loss becoming significantly higher after age 35? Don't believe it. It's your fault that your sweet little baby sister's embryonic body is being expelled. You made her sad, and you deserve to go to the lowest circle with the rest of the traitors. Alas, I fear this is only the first step in Jimmy's aggressive cosmic shaming, for he and his bandmates go on a whirlwind tour of the West Coast as their song climbs the pop charts, possibly because Don McLean's American Pie does not exist in this universe. Or any other good music, for that matter. Jimmy is living large, performing before crowds of about 25 and being mobbed by handfuls of fans, and before long he's passed out drunk in the group van. This movie doesn't bother to examine the nature of temptation too closely, possibly because they're afraid of making it too intriguing. So the consequences of Jimmy's unsanctioned behavior are as swift and extreme as they are improbable. Back home, Pam keeps in contact with her wayward brother, who, despite his chart-topping success, can only afford to call her via payphone, and leads prayer circles for his safety, despite developing stage 4 too good for this sinful earth disease. In fact, her condition is so advanced that her doctors are recommending a very scary and risky surgery, which Jimmy encourages her to take so he can feel extra bad about her death later. Meanwhile, in the comic missionary subplot... I'll take lines that describe both Saturday's Warrior and a porno for 500, Ken. <clears throat> As I was saying, Wally and Harold are still having the usual difficulties. Hey, how you doing? I 
don't speak English. There she is, everyone, the best character in the entire movie. Let's give her a big hand. The A and B plots suddenly converge when Jimmy has a chance meeting with his future brother-in-law. Oh, okay, he here's the thing. You see, I never draw people the way they are. I draw people the way they could be. Yes, Jimmy, you could be this empty-eyed, came-with-the-frame model if only you abandoned all this silly independence nonsense. Todd starts up a G-rated love-in as he sings about his philosophy about the meaning of life, which is basically that it has meaning. You must admit, there is something endearingly amusing about these straight-laced saints dressing up in 1960s theme party costumes and pretending to be part of the Haight-Ashbury set. Yeah, it's kind of like the Pure Flix version of hair. Sweet Lucifer, are those the piano guys? Do the Latter-day Saints have some kind of monopoly on YouTube pop classical acts or what? Jimmy is understandably quite distressed when he sees a portrait of his younger sister in Todd's sketchbook and he runs away. Meanwhile, Elder Harold suggests to Elder Wally that they try witnessing to Todd, which they have not done despite seeing him in the park every single time they've been there. I am not buying that. Usually the only excuse Mormon missionaries need to start talking to someone is for them to be breathing and within eyeshot. But the inspirational music soars as Elder Harold shows Todd his primitive PowerPoint, and less than a minute later they have a new convert. Jimmy, meanwhile, has reached the depth of his moral decay, which seems to be indicated by his hair length, as he's too agitated by fame or substance abuse or whatever to pay heed to his soon-to-be-dead sister and has a falling out with the band. Or what? Can to kick me out? I am warrior. Which is even harder to take seriously now that Weird has done pretty much the exact same scene. And so we find Jimmy lost and forlorn in an alley under a rain machine, singing about how he feels alone and wants to be accepted for who he is. Isn't there a someone who can take me as I am? The implication being that the answer to his prayer lies in the quarreling, restrictive, borderline abusive family who spent the past 90 minutes telling him to be anybody other than himself. And to further twist the knife, Jimmy calls home to discover his saintly soon-to-be-dead sister is now his saintly actually dead sister. understand that Pam's brief life of suffering and tragedy did indeed have a purpose, and that purpose was to be a saintly model disabled person who exists to inspire those more fortunate before dying for the express purpose of shaming her prodigal brother back into the fold? That's the long and the short of it, yeah. But that, that's horrible! That's monstrous! That's a level of deliberate sadism and callous indifference we'd normally expect from your end! The mother in Christmas shoes had it better than that! Yes, let the hate flow through you. Where are the ones called Doug Stewart and Lex de Azevedo? The wrath of the heavens shall be poured out upon them! Their sufferings shall endure even unto the seventh generation! And that's enough hate flowing for now. But I have to agree. Pam's death is an appalling display of sentimental fridging, and it gets worse from there. For after Jimmy follows the ghost of his unborn baby sister, a sequence that looks less like a come-to-the-opposition's-kid moment and more like the beginning of a psychological horror, we get a series of flashbacks to his life with Pam, culminating in the scene of her tragic accident. Hey, 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 Jimmy, Yep, Pam wound up in a wheelchair because she ran into the street chasing after a ball that Jimmy kicked away. Because it's not enough for him to be responsible for his mom's miscarriage and his sister's death, he also needs to be responsible for Pam being disabled to begin with. 
Because just as Pam's purpose in life is to suffer, Jimmy's purpose is to be wrong about everything so everyone else in his family, especially his parents, can demonstrate how loving and forgiving they are. Better? <sighs> yes. Shall we wrap things up? Yes, we shall, because despite there being 20 minutes left in the movie, nothing much else happens. Mom gets pregnant again, Julie goes back to the airport slash hotel to meet the returning Wally, who's bringing the newly baptized Todd with him. And of course, the moment Julie and Todd's eyes meet, it's bland white love at first sight. Jimmy heads back on the road, but not before Dad slips him a letter that Pam wrote before she died, where she tells Jimmy not to blame himself for everything the movie has been blaming him for. And this gives him the courage to publicly renounce his sinful ways. I come from a family of nine, soon to be ten. And, and maybe that is too big, I don't know. But I do know that I've known more love than I deserve in my life because of them. When did that happen? The only relative who's shown Jimmy any real love and acceptance is Pam, and she's dead. Nevertheless, it is enough to bring Jimmy back home just in time to witness little Emily's birth in the exact same room where Pam died. And in this promise in their eyes. Yes, welcome to the world, Emily. You will grow up in the shadow of your saintly dead sister, whose example and memory you will never live up to no matter how hard you try. Your mother is mentally and physically exhausted and will pass you off on your older sisters, and your dad is a petty tyrant who will demand you conform to his image of a dutiful, obedient daughter and future helpmeet to someone just like him, and any deviation from that path will be met with physical and emotional abuse. On the plus side, you will get backstage passes to Jimmy's concerts as he embarks on his new career of being proto-Josh Groban. A story untold A boy dreaming bigger than his own So, did I fulfill the assignment? Well, I should say so. Again, that is certainly not a good movie. I'm pretty sure it's not even good theology. Saturday's Warrior is a prime example of preaching to the choir. Unless you're Mormon and have nostalgia-colored memories of watching the old pro shot, there's not much here that you will find appealing. In fact, you're more likely to be put off by the embarrassingly cheap production, subpar music, and appalling sanctimony, especially if you fall anywhere outside the movie's heteronormative view. So the court of musical hell condemns Doug Stewart and Lex de Azevedo to be reincarnated as women living in the culture they celebrate. A most fitting retribution. Diva, is everything okay? What makes you ask that? Oh, it's just, you know, I do keep an eye on things, professional necessity and all, and the past few cases you seem kind of despondent. Uh, I don't know. It's just... I think music kind of broke me, you know? Ever since then, it's just been... Yes? Uh, I'm not sure how much longer I can keep doing this. A year. You think I've got one more year before this destroys me entirely? No, I think you're very, very close to something, and in, oh, say a year, I think you may very well have sorted it out. In the meantime, chin up. You know what you need right now. You need a case you will really enjoy. Something recent and high profile. Something well known for both alienating fans and confirming critics' misgivings about the material. Ah, uh, you know, I think I see what you're getting at. In fact, you might say it's... Tap, tap, tap tapping on, on the glass. glass. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad we understand each other. Until next time. Until next time. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned. Uh -oh.